empathy is about connection, right? And if I open up and I let someone in and they know about something, the taboo, if they know about that thing, then they can't love me. Hey guys, I'm Ashley Don Rivard, and you are now into the Dawn, a provocative podcast that looks at all things taboo, such as suicide, grief, sex, addictions, and more. Each week, I talk with experts who successfully investigate their areas of interest. And if you like what you hear, please remember to subscribe. Stefan is a former intelligence analyst with the FBI's Joint Regional Intelligence Center. He's worked with Los Angeles Mayor's Crisis Response Team and Suicide Response Team. He has facilitated support groups for adults who are bereaved and for those who have attempted suicide. He's currently developing a curriculum for gatekeepers to make suicide prevention conversations more accessible for everyone. One million people worldwide die by suicide every year. 1.2 million people attempt in the U.S. every year. 47,000 in the U.S. take their life by suicide every year. And of that, 37,000 are males and 10,000 approximately females. It's the second leading cause of death for Americans between the ages of 15 to 24 years old. So tell me, how did you become involved at the Suicide Prevention Center as a crisis counselor? Well, I got involved um, when I lost a friend to suicide, and it was a great shock to me, and um, it really scared me because I always thought that her and I were so similar, and it scared me that if someone as accomplished and successful and friendly and beautiful and charming and funny and always helping everyone someone like that could die by suicide and I didn't know what that meant for me so at first it came from a place of fear at that time I didn't really understand much about suicide except for what I learned from TV and movies so I uh, grieved my friend's death um, but there was something there that I wanted to learn more about when I found out there was opportunities for people to volunteer and talk to people on a crisis hotline and there are similar opportunities all over the world for excuse me all over the country for people to do that and then when I started learning more about suicide and uh, suffering and silence and sacred silence and learning that um, that talking about suicide and and being honest about what's going on inside, it's it's not just okay. It's kind of like the path towards healing. Mm-hmm. And so, so what I found is that I've been able to kind of grieve and make meaning around my friend's death. And also I've got to learn more about myself. And it's just completely changed my life. And mm-hmm. so while I wish that my friend hadn't died, of course, um, I, I feel honored, right? Mm-hmm. I think it's something like that. I feel honored honored that I'm able to um, do something with that with that pain and with that loss so and it's been four or so, or so years now and it's been it's been really personally and professionally gratifying and also just like healing I feel like I've I've gotten a lot from this so that's kind of how I found my way here wow what in your opinion then from working on the lines have you learned is the root cause of suicide I think from from my own experience and my point of view um, it's a sense of disconnection you know people who have any experience with the 12-step program they may have heard that that adage that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety the opposite of addiction is connection and I think that's definitely true with suicidal thoughts and suicide in general is that there's so much stigma and there's so much um, misunderstandings around suicide and so being disconnected from 
family, being disconnected from loved ones, being disconnected from our dreams or our goals, being disconnected from ourselves. Mm. I think that when people throw out words uh, and talk about other risk factors like hopelessness and helplessness and substance use or mental health concerns, all of those things that are true, um, it's a sense of being disconnected mm -hmm. because when we wake up and feel alone and today is going to be just like yesterday and what's the point all of these thoughts which turns out the research tells us is something that almost everyone if not every human will experience the sense of like i'm just kind of done mm -hmm. and so th it's a sense of disconnection that i think is is present i think disconnection is is the thing that makes suicide um, continue, you know, and connection is the thing that can, c that can stop that. Mm. Um, it's, and it's paradoxical because of course we're not told that it's okay to talk about suicide mm -hmm. yet. Um, the only way out is through, uh, and, and that's true with, with suicidal thoughts too. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I think a sense of disconnection is yeah. the biggest, okay. is for me is the biggest feature of, of suicide. You mentioned something about the misconceptions people have. Can you expand on some of those misconceptions that are out there regarding suicide? Yeah. So, and there's lots of books and articles going back hundreds, <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years probably um, about different cultural and religious aspects of death, dying, suicide, self-harm. And I'm not an expert on those. It's, it's just interesting to to note that there are these that there's a there's a there's a a layer on top of all of this which is our culture where we come from uh, our families so all of us you know death is scary and at least uh, you know the way i was raised is that death is not something that we should talk about we don't see it so with suicide even more so and one of the one of the most damaging or uh, unhelpful stigmas around suicide is that if you talk about this, you can make it worse. You can make the suicide stronger. You can fan the flames. So that's one of the biggest stigmas is that, that if you're having thoughts of suicide, there's something wrong with you. If you talk about it and you say it out loud, it can make it worse. For the person... Or if somebody asks the person, are you thinking about suicide? Well, well, both. And I think that that's one of the reasons why so many people may struggle at first with broaching the topic. You know, there's a sense of, um, number one, I don't want to ask because the answer could be very scary. Right. And I don't know how to handle it. Or it could make it, they or, could, or it could make do it, it. Yeah, they make it do it. Like, I could be the thing. and. That and pushes them over. Pushes them over the edge. And <laughs> no pun intended. I mean, that's, yeah. but that's. That's the sense, and that's certainly the way that I was raised. Mm. And there's a lot of things that we're not allowed to talk about in polite company. And suicide, along with all the other things, it, but it's hard because here's another piece of it, which I think is important, and, I, and I've learned through my work on a crisis hotline, is that people feel bad as though they did it as though they made the thoughts they they take ownership over those suicidal thoughts and mm -hmm. here's an and yes that's another stigma is that we make our thoughts and that we are responsible for our thoughts but i'm glad we live in the the age that we do and so the research and all of the scholarship now tells us that's not really how it works we don't make our thoughts so much as we experience our thoughts and our thoughts and our mind is one of just reacting to the things around us. And I heard a, I heard a, and a quote a while ago that it helps me and I've used it on the lines and I think it helps people who are in crisis. It's your brain produces thoughts like your mouth produces saliva. Hmm, I like that. Yeah, and but we don't get mad at our mouth <laughs> for producing saliva. You're at a restaurant, you see the food coming, and you start to salivate. We don't get mad at ourselves for that, but we beat ourselves up over our thoughts. Absolutely. Yet it's just what brains do. We have 10 thoughts every second. We're only aware of maybe one or two of them, but 
With 10 thoughts every second, we can, and I know I have in the past, I've beaten myself up over one thought I had five years ago, and I keep rehashing it as if that will change it or it means something about myself. So, so I think that's one of the things that's so helpful about mindfulness or DBT is that if we can get some space between ourselves and our thoughts, we are not our thoughts. And just because you're having thoughts of suicide, um, actually, it doesn't mean you're a suicidal person. Mm. Uh, and just because you're having thoughts of suicide doesn't mean, well, it, it, that alone, it just means you're a human being. And you are someone who is going through something that it, and it's probably scary. And here's something else that I've learned from On the Lines is that Sometimes people call when the suicidal thoughts have been happening so often and they've been just keeping it to themselves and it's scary and it's scary and it's scary and then all of a sudden one day it's not scary anymore. And that can scare mm. people, you know, because all of a sudden it's just, well, I guess this is my lot in life. I guess I'm just a, a person who is always thinking about suicide. The person's relationship to their thoughts about suicide is really important sometimes it's not the thoughts that are so painful it's the thoughts about the thoughts why can't i stop thinking about suicide intrusive thoughts right yeah right why can't i stop this now that i want to or again it goes back to that i'm responsible for my thoughts and i am in control of everything that's happening on the inside of me mm. but that's not really uh mm -hmm. well at least that's i subscribe to the to the to the point of view that that's not really how it is inside us we are experiencing so much so i think we if if all those things are, are true or possible then um we don't need to it, it, brene brown I, I love when she talks about the difference between guilt and shame and that's certainly the case with suicide is that sure we there's things that we can feel guilty over okay i I got a ticket or I didn't turn this uh, this thing in and my mm -hmm. boss yelled at me. Mm -hmm. Okay, next time mm -hmm. I'm going to try to turn it in, you know, or sooner and I feel guilty. Mm -hmm. So guilt is I made a mistake. Shame is I am a mistake. And if we can separate the sense of shame and self-recrimination, I'm broken. There's something wrong with me. Then I feel like we can start having conversations about what's going on. Mm. Um, and that's what we get when we talk to people. Mm. Yeah, that's good. I, I, I was I was gonna s ask you this a little later, but it, it kind of plays on what you were just saying. I wanted to make a statement, and then have you kind of expand on how that relates, or what comes to mind. So the statement is: the barriers to empathy are the taboos we carry around. Oh yeah. I agree with that 100%. I mean, I can speak from my own experience in my own life. Um, the taboos are the things that's keeping me separate from everyone. You mm -hmm. know, it's not so there's taboos around sex, religion, um, professional taboos, personal taboos, the private spaces that we have that we're worried that if they became public, then people may look at us differently, or however we, right. we, we talk about uh, or think about taboos. So um, empathy is about connection, right? And if I open up and I let someone in and they know about something, the taboo, if they know about that thing, then they can't love me, you know? The unconditional positive regard that comes with empathy and then the kind of empathy that, interestingly, a crisis counselor on a hotline can give to, to a caller. There's an amazing freedom that comes not only with the anonymity and the confidentiality from the caller's point of view they can experience, but also from us is that there's no baggage. There's no family ties. There's no personal history. There's just two people just who it's just honesty, as they say in 12-step programs, rigorous honesty. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, there's no, nothing's off limits. And there's no judgment. 
And so I so that quote that you read, the the thing that's getting in between the uh, the empathy would be judging. You know, it's it's easy to judge. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's so it's so easy. But to actually hear when someone is talking about the pain that they feel that maybe the type of love that they have in their heart they can't express openly, you know, because they have in the past had someone judge them for it mm. or someone whose um, legal status perhaps is something that they don't feel like they can share and therefore, or maybe in the past they've been um, marginalized and othered as a result. Mm -hmm. These are blocks to us mm -hmm. connecting. And there's so many different types of taboos, of course, yet we're all, we all speak the same language. We all have the same basic things we want. We want, we want to, we want to be connected. Mm -hmm. We want to feel love. We want, it, it's interesting how similar we all are. And I've learned that by talking to people who are in like deep, deep crisis suicidal crisis and what ended up happening is i thought i was going to help people who were thinking about killing themselves but what ended up happening is i went there and i was the one uh, who was changed I and that. and that's a beautiful thing and i know that i don't personally i don't like it when people tell me what to do right i certainly don't like it when people tell me how to feel uh. and if someone told me not to kill myself i don't think i would listen to anything right. they said after that so it's just been it's been a great experience to sit with people and we're both changed for it what is empathy versus sympathy well i think empathy is for me empathy is about humility humility at least for me humility is the thing that makes the empathy go without a sense of humility and by that i mean um i don't know what it's like to be you and i want to and i want to know and i'm going to try to know and in the trying and in the yearning and the seeking to know um and entering a space where there is um not 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 only balance but we are on the same plane versus and i'm sure there's probably a better dictionary definition but for me that is what empathy looks like sympathy however is definitely a, a different kind of positionality for sure and it's also you know i'm happy to learn as much about you as i need in order to pass judgment you know wow. I, I mean i think <laughs> that's just that's just what i'm coming up with now and right. i that feels right to me because empathy again with humility and wanting, I think it's the wanting to know that makes suicide prevention, which is just another way of saying conversations about suicide. I think it's the yearning and the wanting to know. Tell me more. I'm curious. Because most of our conversations in our lives, when someone's upset, we want it to be over. I mean, here's the tissue. You know, mm -hmm. um, let's talk about lunch, <laughs> you know, yeah, let's yeah, yeah. let's move on. But no, what if what you just said is important? I totally understand why you're having these thoughts, why you're experiencing these thoughts. Tell me more. Sitting in the dark, sitting in the dark place. It's and when you're in the dark place, as I just meant, as I just said a few minutes ago, when I started sitting in the dark place, I started finding my own healing and it, and I don't use these words um, lightly when I say that sitting in another person's darkness and despair actually illuminates both people's lives. Mm. So long as you enter that space in a non judgmental, in a humble way, in a patient way, in a patient way. If somebody has been calling a line, for six months every day and hanging up at the beginning of every call because they're so frightened of hearing another voice. And finally, on the day that they start talking and I'm the one who ends up, which happened, and I'm the one, it's like the patience and the care and the respect. And before I started working in this space, 
I thought those were just words and they didn't mean anything. Mm. But they are the most important things. It's almost like it's something to live into. These words, it's, you know, it's almost like it's something, it's like love is a verb, you know? Mm. It's something that we do. And anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. It's a practice. It's a practice. And so, and it's not something to perfect. And I don't think that someone who's in deep despair, whether it's a crisis that has a suicidal kind of uh, uh, aspect to it, or if someone's just in a crisis, uh, we don't, not only do we not need to be perfect, nobody wants to talk to a perfect person. Mm -hmm. I think that our flaws and warts and all, I think that's another important aspect of connection, is that we don't need to um, appear any type of way except to be ourselves and the great thing is we all have an inner compass. Our intuition is really mm -hmm. good mm -hmm. at telling us if something is going on. If you're sitting with someone and you get a sense that there's something wrong, mm -hmm. like that means something. Right. It's worth exploring. exploring that. Yeah. And so it's interesting how we all have in us everything we need to do what we've been talking about. Uh, anyone can do suicide prevention. It's just another way of saying how to talk to someone in a way that is um, is honest and is real and is present. And yes, it takes practice, but it's absolutely possible. If I could do it, <laughs> anybody <laughs> could do it. Yeah. 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 What do you think is the root cause of suicide? Here's something else which is really hard, and it's true for me. I've struggled with this, is... The sense that the way it feels right now, the way it is today, this is how it's going to be forever. Totally. And yeah. I have never been able to think my way out of that. I've certainly tried, and I may have even, you know, you try to journal your way out of that. You try <laughs> to y yoga your way out yeah. of that. You try to, you know, but... Drink your way out Drink, of yeah. There's so many different ways. There's so many yeah. different ways that we can... Now, we can numb ourselves, certainly, but you, you, the only way out of that, again, the only way out is through. It's scary. Um, I heard a thing a while ago that someone said, you know, fake it till you make it. I heard someone say, face it till you make it. I love that. Isn't that great? So, so for me, the sense of this is my life now. This is my life. And... Uh, and the sadness and the disappointment Ugh, and the yeah. and the all, th all the despair, all the things that could have been are gone now. And, you know, worrying about the past, fretting about the future. It's 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 so interesting because r despite how acutely someone might sound, you know, uh, suicidal and th the high risk on a, on a call on a crisis line. It's still this universal thing that we all experience. Like we all experience this, just not everyone is talking about it. It takes so much courage for people to call any crisis line. Any crisis line doesn't matter if it's a domestic violence or intimate partner violence hotline. Doesn't matter if it's rape, abuse, incest, a rain, a hotline, teen lines. Any. It takes so mm -hmm. much courage to call and say. I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And that is, and it, it doesn't mean that they are uniquely um, pained. I mean, they are the ones who have the courage to say what the rest of us can't. Mm. Mm. And mm. they, they're going into this space that gives, gives, certainly gives me the courage to start showing up for myself. Mm -hmm. um, and as many people who call these lines and the numbers are growing still these people are amazing there it's a heroic effort to call and show up for yourself mm -hmm. like that and it doesn't matter if you're calling from a bridge or you're calling because you're holding pills or you just took pills the 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 sense of i'm not going to do it on my own anymore i'm going to reach out mm -hmm. and that is it's changed my life mm -hmm listening to and talking with people who are saying um help me because i also want to be able to they're say they're the most vulnerable yeah, yeah. it's and just honesty vulnerability yeah. yeah how many people call the lines a month a year 
it's more than a hundred thousand per, per year. year. Okay. And the numbers are going up and up and up. Yeah. And there's more people who are who are using online crisis chat services okay. as well as there's companies now that have crisis tech services. Trevor Project mm-hmm. has a great program for LGBTQIA youth that they can call. They can also chat online. There's texting. So there's but the numbers are going up and up and up. So if a million people in America are attempting every year and there are tens of thousands of people who are calling the crisis hotlines each month, um, then it means that fewer and fewer people are suffering in silence, Mm -hmm. which which is great. What would you tell people who may be listening that are suffering with thoughts of suicide? I would say that um, that what you're going through is a is a is such a human experience, and that we all go through it, and that we all experience it. Yes, the research tells us that this is true. That every person will at some point experience thoughts of suicide. So yes, we have research. We also have just like our own experience and so i can speak from my own experience and from my own from my own heart is that this is something that we all struggle with in different shapes in different ways it, it has a different color for everyone i'm sure uh, the idea that that's it i'm done sometimes there's passive thoughts you know if a bus just hit me then and <laughs> oh the, for sure right. and so that. and so w- it's so common and it's just so it's so interesting that there's this huge discrepancy, this massive uh, uh, difference between uh, how common the thoughts are and the stigma that says, don't you dare talk about this. Don't you dare mm-hmm. talk about it and don't you dare ask somebody about it. So I would say that if you're having thoughts of suicide, whether they be passive thoughts like, well, if, it, if I just dropped dead, then that would be fine. Or if you're having active thoughts, if you have a plan, if you've written a suicide note, if you if you have the means, if you have a timeline, if you've already attempted and you're in the midst of an attempt right now, it's what you're going through is a human. It's a human thing. It's such a human thing. And it's a universal thing. And yes, we all go through such so, so many. I mean, life is so hard. There's so much suffering that we're subjected to. And suicidal thoughts are a completely understandable, um, common human response. You know, the thoughts are such a such a human response to pain, mm-hmm. pain. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I would say, if you can, you can call the national lifeline. The number is one eight hundred two seven three eight two five five. That's one eight hundred two seven three eight two five five. You can call 911. Mm-hmm. It's a great to know that 911, that's what they're there for, for these kind of uh, issues as well, for welfare checks for someone if you, if you have a loved one and you're worried. Um, there's so many people who are waiting to support, not fix, but support, you know, and that we can all support each other. And if you can, reach out. Mm-hmm. And you may end up not only, I mean, hopefully you will find the experience to be uh, uh, supportive and comforting. And you may end up talking to someone like me, and then my life mm-hmm. is improved. My life, I, I get healing. Mm-hmm. I get the kind of growth, or I get to connect to another human, which is what I want. So we all benefit from it. So if you can muster the courage and take that step, you'll end up, um, you'll end up doing a lot. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so yeah. I love how you said that your life will change because a common thing you hear people who have thoughts of suicide say is, "Well, I'm a burden, mm-hmm. right? That people are better off without me. I'm a burden." And in turn, you're saying, when you share with me your innermost being, you help me. So not only do you help yourself by speaking your truth, you help the other. That's right. Yeah, it's it's an amazing thing. And 
maybe five years ago, I would have thought that that's not possible. Mm -hmm. And it does have a kind of paradoxical quality mm -hmm. to it. That How could that be that I tell someone something and that I get relief and their life improves as a result of it too? Right. So long as we don't try to fix each other, so long as we just sit together in this dark place and then because we're both still responsible for our own lives, we're both responsible for getting ourselves out of this dark place. But what's interesting and just kind of taking an analogy that Father Greg Boyle of Homeboy Industry uses is, is that we all have flashlights and it's not my job to pull you out of this dark place, but rather I can shine a flashlight for you to help you. Maybe there's certain things at your, at your feet that's making it hard for you to climb out, you know, uh, and you can shine a flashlight for me too. Mm -hmm. uh, or you walking out gives me somewhere to follow as well. So there's, there's so much that can happen when two people just get really, really honest with each other. Mm -hmm. And it's very, it's very rare. Mm -hmm. It's very rare. But when it happens, and it just takes one person to take that, to take that first step, and say, "I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can we talk? Or right. please help." Yeah. And it can start with that. Yeah. yeah. There's what you call on the lines a third party caller, right? So it's somebody who is calling to talk about their concern about a loved one, a friend, a, f a, f a daughter, a son, or whatever it may be. If somebody is listening who is experiencing, you know, knowing somebody close to them who is dealing with suicidal ideation and, you know, they're freaked out and don't know what to do, what would you say to those people? That's a great question. And I would say number one is that you can talk to that loved one about suicide you can say to them you know sometimes when people lose their job or sometimes when people break up with their significant other or you know sometimes when people get devastating news from their doctor or whatever the scenario is sometimes when sometimes when people um get sometimes when life happens <laughs> people have thoughts of suicide are you having thoughts of suicide? And just to reiterate what we, what we talked about a while ago, because it's still true, <laughs> is that by asking these questions and saying the word suicide, it's not the S word like it used to be referred to, just like they used to say s cancer was the C word, you know, as if you could kind of speak it into existence. Mm. So if you ask someone about suicide, you're not planting the thoughts. That's been disproved. Just like teaching sex ed in school will make kids have sex. That's also not true. All these things have been debunked. So you can ask them, are you having thoughts of suicide? Are you struggling with suicide? Are you thinking about killing yourself? You know, Sometimes when people go through what you went through, they can have thoughts of ending their life. Are you having these thoughts? And the, the powerful thing is that if they're having thoughts of suicide, they have an opportunity to know that someone cares and they can respond if they feel if they feel like they can. And also if they're not having thoughts of suicide, they know then that this person cares and they know that this is the kind of person that can handle big topics, mm -hmm. you know, because again, the stigmas, the stigmas are stigmas because it's like suicide is the this is the biggest and toughest and most intense and uh, topic. Now, we know it's not because we can say these words now. But so much, again, it goes back to the stigmas that talking about suicide can make it worse. And mm -hmm. don't you dare talk mm -hmm. about this. So for all these people out there that may be listening, you may know someone who's struggling. Could be somebody who's recently sober, someone who's got out of uh, jail or prison and formerly incarcerated. And it's okay to, to ask them about these things. What about uh, people who have um, kids? Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's even more scary, it's right? It's terrifying. Having a son or a daughter that you feel, you know, is depressed and are they suicidal? And give some signs to look for. Sure. Yeah, it absolutely. That's it's hearing 
from parents or caregivers on the lines who are worried about their kids. It's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. you know? So we, number one, it's, it's okay to ask. Because when we ask people, are you having thoughts of suicide? Are you having thoughts of ending your life? Do you ever think about killing yourself? What we're saying to someone is, I see you. Mm. And that's, I think, what when people are calling is they want to be seen, you know? They want to be seen and they want, they, yeah, look at me. I'm in pain. Will mm -hmm. someone look at me? And mm -hmm. will, don't pass me Kleenex. Mm -hmm. you know, don't tell me that everything's going to be okay. Don't promise me those things. So, so for a parent to say, are you having thoughts of suicide? It shows I see you mm -hmm. and I'm attentive. Now, what are the things that we could see? We could see kids who are, I mean, it, it, well, the, the first thing I would say is that anytime parents have a, and caregivers have a baseline, mm -hmm. they know mm -hmm. what their kids are like. And so any major deviation from that baseline, so if a kid is often s staying up late and maybe playing video games or on the phone and all of a sudden they're spending a lot of time sleeping, for example, you know, that just is one that just came to mind as far as that is just a, is it a different, anytime there's something that comes up and all of a sudden things are different, kids are gregarious and engaging, engaging and all of a sudden withdrawn and mm. sullen. Sometimes people stop taking care of themselves as far as personal hygiene. You know, all these little things add up, as well as people could be taking preparatory mm -hmm. actions, right? Mm -hmm. People could be writing notes. People could be saying goodbye. People could start selling off mm -hmm. items, you know? So there's a lot of things that people can be aware of. And the thing about being a parent or a, or a caregiver is they're attuned to their kids, right? Mm -hmm. And so anytime there's a change, it's something to be aware of. And the good thing about the, the crisis hotlines, and there's all different sorts we mentioned mm -hmm. before, is that parents or caregivers, just like siblings or friends, can call a line and say, "There's, I think something's going on. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And it can be helpful to brainstorm in a collaborative way say, I'm worried about my daughter. I'm worried about my son. They, for example, self-harm is, yeah, is, is a lot. Right. Normal. And so parents ri quite rightly could be, would be very concerned about a child that's self-harming, just like a child that may be uh, having experiencing like an eating disorder. And so, so a parent could call or a caregiver could call and say, I'm worried. How do I talk about this? And so with a counselor who's trained, you could talk through some, okay, here's some good questions that you can ask your, your child, mm -hmm. including, you know, sometimes when people uh, self-harm, they, they're having thoughts of not wanting to be around anymore and not wanting to live. Is this true for you? Are you having those kind of thoughts? So it's, it's, so, it's so powerful that when we can, we can stop trying to figure it all out on our own because life's hard and figuring it all out on our own mm -hmm. is is pretty daunting yeah. but when we can bring someone else in it could be a school counselor could be a teacher could be a mental health professional could be another family member feel like okay we can talk some, you know we don't want to talk to somebody who's dismissive obviously we want someone to take these things seriously yeah. and see like okay what's the next best step yeah. and the good thing is that there's a lot of resources a lot of people who are poised and ready to help this has been so educational for me and for so many people and thank you so much for sharing i want to wrap it up with um, some resources that you think are really important for people uh, whether you know it be the suicide line or just kind of what what you suggest yeah there's a bunch uh the first one which is good is the national crisis lifeline and that's for people who are experiencing a crisis that's suicidal crisis or it's a non-suicidal crisis and like we were saying before life is really hard and things are always coming at us so that's really useful uh, the phone number as i said before which is 24 7 and uh, that's 1-800-273-8255 and the website which has a lot of useful resources as well 
is suicidepreventionlifeline.org. So suicide prevention lifeline l-i-f-e-l-i-n-e dot org and we mentioned before there's phone as well as crisis chat so the crisis chat portal um, where you can talk to a counselor on the computer that's also accessible through that website another good website about background information and just general information about suicide which is really valuable uh, suicide is preventable Dot org. That's a really good one. Suicideispreventable.org. Another one is suicideisdifferent.org. Suicide is different. Oh, 211 is very useful, and that's all over the country. So 211, it's like 411 or 911, but 211 is a resource that people can call and speak with an operator to get social services. It could be um, regarding a food uh, insecurity could be regarding uh, experiencing homelessness, uh, therapy, or whether it be low cost or sliding scale. So a lot of different. And now we learn that there hopefully very soon will be a three digit uh, phone number for suicide prevention. So that is something which is coming very soon, uh, we hope. So there's a lot of resources, like we said before, uh, Trevor Project, for LGBTQIA youth, uh, which you can Google Trevor Project. There's the teen line, which is really great in that there's trained teenagers that serve as phone counselors. So there can be a kind of a peer-to-peer -peer, um, dynamic, which is great because we want to be able to talk to people that we can relate to and speak with. So teen line is great, and the website is teen line online. Org and, and there's a lot of good information there. So there's a lot of good stuff. We're living in a time where more and more people are paying attention to suicide, both awareness of suicide, prevention measures, as well as uh, what they call postvention, so suicide bereavement. So there's a lot of attention, and it has been uh, for many years now. Uh, so we're living in a time where it's getting increasingly okay to talk about it, mm -hmm. but we've got a long way to go. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Brian, for being here today and sharing your wisdom and shining some light on suicide. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay. That's it for today's podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen today. Please let me know what you think. Leave a comment, share, and we'll be back next week with a new episode.